welcome to Healthy for My Purpose. We are here with the amazing Shane Martin and from Shane Temple. Oh my goodness, you did not just have a sound effect, Shay. <laughs> podcast. Nice. He, he's, he brought his own audience with you guys. I brought my, yeah. Sorry. So, <laughs> yeah, so he came all equipped with his own fan base. And so we just heard them in the back there. But welcome, Shane. We're so happy to have you on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, um, I needed this, to be honest with you. <laughs> Y'all are like two of my favorite people. And my mind is kind of fried after the past couple of months and the last weekend. So this is like a balm for my soul. So. Oh, good. Little therapy session for you, Shane. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, um, Shane, you and I have known each other for a while now. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think like how long. I think we met in 2015. I think we tried to figure this out before 2014 or 2014. maybe even... Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it was 2014 was when I moved to Jackson, and um, yeah, we met through uh, Matthew and Alyssa, mm -hmm. and did an event with them, and yeah, just yeah. So it's been almost ten, golly, ten I years. I know, isn't that wild? <laughs> Time Whoa. goes by so quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Awesome. What, but what's interesting is we always talk about how much our kind of our journeys paralleled mm -hmm. from the standpoint of we were both in jobs mm -hmm. that, you know, that we were maybe hoping to maybe didn't even see ourselves transitioning out of. And then when you and I caught back up, you were going back to school and mm -hmm. I was starting the blog and then it's just been, yeah, I, that's the thing that always intrigues me is just how much our stories parallel. Yeah. Yeah. On the yeah. Similar path. And, yeah. um, and so, you know, for those that don't know your story, cause we have a lot of people in our group, um, who may not know you. Um, and I thought, you know, we could just kick off with that. Just kind of take us back to your plant-based journey. How did it all start? Yeah. Um, so didn't grow up overweight, didn't grow up, um, unhealthy, I guess, from what the, you know, um, the more modern or whatever you, whatever's conceived, considered healthy. I wasn't considered unhealthy, um, but grew up in the South, Mississippi, grew up playing sports, very active, and then got out of college, moved to Nashville and just started gaining weight because I got lazy. And uh, when I moved to Nashville, I think I weighed 189 pounds and that was back in 93. And by the time I got married, which was six years later, so I was 26, I weighed 240 pounds and just continued to gain more weight. And then about two weeks for, before my 40th birthday, uh, in 2013, I tipped the scales at about 300 pounds, a little more. And, you know, it was, had all the things that come along with being obese and overweight. I was uh, had type two diabetes, uh, extremely high blood pressure, cholesterol was through the roof. I think my cholesterol was over 400 or something like that. And uh, fatty liver. I, I mean, just, I was a, I was a walking disaster show. And uh, I reached out I just, I, you know, I'd done like everybody does keto, paleo, Atkins, counting fat grams, you know, that starving, you know, that kind of thing and would always lose weight, but gain it back pretty quickly and reached out to a friend of mine to try to get the number of another friend because I'd seen he had gotten healthy and lost weight. And he had told me that our mutual friend had gone vegan. And then immediately I was like, nah, not for me, you know. Because for me, vegans didn't take baths, walked around with crystals in their pockets, ate grass and bark, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, um, so I, uh, but he said, no, go watch Forks Over Knives. And I feel like that's kind of the entry show for a lot of us that have moved over to being plant-based. And so it was like two weeks before my 40th birthday, my wife and I sat down and watched it and 
I just kind of went cold turkey, so to speak, no pun intended the next day. And, um, just really, sorry about that. Realized that I could, um, eat and get healthy, which I loved. And so I, um, immediately did that. And I think in the first three months I lost 55 pounds and had a, my physical for the first time in a long time. And just my cholesterol had gone from over 400 to 199. My blood pressure dropped, uh, from like 153 over 106. It was like 126 over 79. And there was no sign of diabetes in my system at all. I mean, everything looked great. And so, um, I think for me, that was kind of the turning point because I had told myself, if this doesn't work, I'm not going to, there's no way I'll stick with this. And when I saw the results, um, I was like, oh my, this, this is real. Like I, I'm a walking test case, you know, I'm walking evidence. And I, I guess that's maybe not fair that I, to say that I wouldn't have stuck with it. I mean, I felt better than I had ever felt. And that was a huge change because I wasn't hungry, which is the thing that I noticed from when you diet, you diet, you, you know, you're, you're depriving yourself. And so that was the thing for me. I, I the, it didn't feel like deprivation. If I was hungry, I ate, it was just, I realized my body knew what to do with the right thing. So, um, that's kind of the 30,000 foot view. And then, um, that, yeah, so that was, man, that was 10 and a half years ago. So, and then, uh, I think kind of like you, you just, with things that change your life, you become passionate about. And, and so, um, I started the blog back in 2017, but it was just kind of a way to provide recipe. Well, and it was actually, I started a few, a couple of years before that, just to kind of provide recipes for family members and friends asking what I was doing, but it just kind of grew more into like, Oh, I hear you can make money doing this. I never thought it would be my job. And then in 2019, we made the decision to go full time with it. And fortunately it's worked out. So I've been doing that since, you know, 2019 and then 2020 was my first full year as a full-time blogger and then COVID hit and that was great. So. So you, Shane, you have a big family. You can tell us about your family, but what, what happened to the people around you? Tell us from their perspective, how did your family evolve when this happened to you? Yeah, I think that is a great question. And, um, because I feel like so many of these questions always come, how did your life change? How did your life change? And you, you're like probably the first per y'all are probably the first ones that have asked that question. Like how did it affect those around you? And, and, um, it, I mean, it changed everything. Um, you know, I have five kids and my oldest just graduated college and my second oldest is in college and I've got two in high school and one junior high. But at the time they were all, my oldest was like 11. And so my son was like nine. And then I had, you know, my littles. And I think what it did, my wife says it best. I feel like it made them feel secure because I, I, I wasn't just overweight. It was obvious. My whole family was worried about me. Like, I mean, I had sleep apnea and my wife would just wake up at night cause I snored so bad, but she would have to move me because she would notice that I would stop breathing, which is what happens during sleep apnea. And I think one of the things I noticed is I had taken a nap one Sunday afternoon, like when I was well into my journey being planned, but maybe seven, eight months into it. And it was a Sunday afternoon. I was laying down, taking a nap and I was on that verge of just waking up and kind of coming out of it and but still had my eyes closed and I could hear. And my next to youngest daughter, Mackenzie, I think she was probably five or six at the time. And she said, mommy, daddy don't snore any, no more. And, um, he doesn't, I don't hear him breathe anymore. And meaning I wasn't, you know, <gasps> when I slept, like it didn't seem like a chore to breathe. And, um, I think for her, for me, this, it made them secure. Um, it definitely changed how we ate in the house and, 
but it was a lot easier to get them on board just because they'd seen that they looked at it as like, we're doing this to save daddy. And so, but I would say security is the the biggest impact that it had on our immediate family. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I just think, I think that's the word that sums it up security. Yeah. You know, Shane, you are um, very vocal in terms of being a believer and a Christian man. Um, How has your faith kind of intersected with your decision to take charge of your health and adopt this whole food plant-based lifestyle? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because, um, you know, it was, it was funny. I was having this very conversation with uh, Dr. Milton Mills this past weekend. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's from the game, uh, what the health and, and, um, I think the game changers and just dear man, absolutely just got to sit down and talk. And we were kind of talking about this idea of how our lifestyle and our, um, our, um, our beliefs kind of intersect and how does that happen? You know, I think for me, hmm, it, I think, you know, I worked, I was in ministry for 15 years and I was in ministry before I got healthy. And I think what I saw for me, I think there's two sides to that coin. One, I see a point, I see a part of me that was just incredibly apprehensive to this idea of being vegan or plant-based because there are so many caricatures and stereotypes and falsehoods attached to those terms. It's, um, you know, there seems like there has to be this debate between is it science or is it God? And I'm like, well, if you believe in God, you believe he created science and intellect. And, you know, and then you've got the other component as are you conservative or liberal now? You know, and it's and it and I think for me, that's what I loved about Forks Over Knives is it just went to the heart of the matter. And it it was like, before you can think about taking care of your environment and the planet, you better take care of yourself. And I think for me, how it enhanced me and how it played into who I was uh, being in ministry, I started realizing that ministers are some of the most unhealthy people in the church. And it's like, I asked people, do you want to go to a 350 pound doctor that's telling you how to get better? Well, in the same way, do you want to hear a sermon from a 400 pound pastor that that obviously can't exercise self control, and so, and I'm not saying that's everybody. We know that there are people that have genetic dispositions to some of being heavier. So I'm not trying to fat shame or anything like that. But I'm saying, for me as a Christian, for me, um, it enhanced a lot of what I do. It made it. Ha- I had more energy. I felt like I could focus more. So from studying and reading. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have my tired spells. I didn't have, um, I, I I think it, it just enhanced everything. And I think from a spiritual perspective, you know, I think going back to the garden, you know, it's kind of how we were intended to eat, you know, there wasn't supposed to be bloodshed. And so the only reason that bloodshed entered the world is because sin entered the world and, So, you know, we see the first example of blood being shed because it was the response to sin to cover nakedness. So God had to kill one of his creations to clothe sin in a sense, you know, and, and so, um, I, I think for me is like, I I don't want to get on and just tell everybody, oh, if you go eat this hamburger, you're sinning and you're going to go to hell. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying that, you know, it really made me realize um, there's just something pure about it. And there's just something, I, there's some, it, I think it represents abundance because I feel like everywhere you turn, you know, there's just this idea of growth and vegetation and just the imagery of the garden and just that's where perfection rested, you know? And, and so you know, I, I think for me, it, it, it kind of, I felt like it kind of helped me bridge people. Um, because I didn't 
fit the mold of what people thought a vegan was, you, you know, and, um, and so I think for that, number one, being a guy that played sports, you know, which that's way more common now. It's, it's not kind of the proverbial square peg in a round hole, but I think, but again, I just, I think for me, it, it brought a lot of awareness because I realized when I first told people I had gone plant-based and I just started using the word vegan because it was a much more understandable term, I, I was kind of a loner. Um, there wasn't, especially one, I'm in the South and then two, I'm working in a church and, you know, and you definitely are getting comments like, oh, you're one of those now. And they don't just mean, oh, you don't eat meat. Oh, you're, you're going to go protest zoos. You're going to start, uh, you know, it's, it's just funny how the whole, the, the, the political nature gets brought into it. And I'm just like, and so for me, it just goes, okay, we got work to do because, you know, it doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change my character, but it, it, for me, I feel like it enhanced everything. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I've never shamed people for, I, I don't go to barbecues and shame people or anything like that because, you know, you win more flies quote unquote with honey than you do vinegar kind of thing. But, um, I, I don't know. It, it, I just felt like the only way I know to describe it when I was talking to Milton this past weekend, I just feel like it brings an awareness of things, you know, because, um, you know, we were told to, and this is because this is the response. This is one of the responses I got a lot was, well, what do you think about where we're told that we're supposed to have dominion over the earth? And I'm like, yes, we are told to culture, to take care of it, nurture it. We weren't told to rape it and pillage. And so that's what we've done. And it's one thing um, to eat out of necessity, which we should do whether we are eating meat or plants or whatever. Um, it's another thing. I think it's detrimental what we've done and for the sake of industry of where, you, you know, it's just, especially here in America, I think what it did was it woke me up to we are just a nation of um, – waste and abundance and gluttony and just what's the word uh just overexertion you know just investing and in just it's it's not about just enough it's about how much can i how can i how much can i get and so um so i just feel like what it did was it just enhanced and enlightened a lot of things and i don't mean enlightened like oh i'm connecting with the star crab nebula now that's not what i'm talking about i mean you know it just made me think about things you know when you when you're taking into your body and you're concerned about what goes into your body you know you're looking at how was it produced and where did it come from and I think, you know, when it comes to things like factory farming and things, it's like you, you just can't make a case that that justifies any of that the, from what we're doing. So but from a spiritual perspective, you know, I think it just it it just uh, I think it just enhanced everything for me. You know, it just it it made me want to help people more. Mm -hmm. It gave me a passion for people more. Um and so um, I think that was one of the uh, – that would probably be with everything I've just said. I think one of the ways that it just really affected me is it, it almost reignited a passion to speak into people's lives that was kind of flickering, you know, because I had been doing ministry so long. And then there's some – because, you know, a lot of people get burned out in the church and because you're just – and I'm one. I went in thinking, oh, it's going to be the best job I ever had. It's cush and – I go, I talk to people, I lead worship, and then I go home, and then I'm going, oh, man, the weight that you carry emotionally. And that's the other thing, the weight that you carry emotionally and spiritually, then that goes into uh, weighing on you physically and stress levels. And so for me, getting healthy, exercising, um, it helped me. And I can't believe I didn't bring that up at first. That was one of the biggest ways I saw that it helped was it – it helped me with the stress levels. It helped me focus more. It helped me deal with the emotional and the spiritual side of things um, much better than it did when I was extremely unhealthy and lethargic and not feeling well. And so um, there was no area that it didn't touch, and, and it only served to enhance what I did. It never prohibited it.
Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you experienced, I know what Cersei and I have talked about, we experienced is that mental and spiritual clarity that, you know, you just don't get when you're eating a bad diet, you know, you just don't have it and you don't know you don't have it until you get out of that place where you're eating those pro-inflammatory toxic foods. And then yeah. it's, you know, Cersei's described it as it was like the heavens opened and I could, you know. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it was. I mean, seriously, that that's what it was like, like the heavens opened and the skies parted. And I mean, it just was, I mean, it, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it really, really was amazing. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess in essence, you became more healthy for your purpose, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, wow. Way to get that in there. <laughs> yeah. Got it in there. <laughs> no, but I think, I think that's yeah. true though. I mean, it's, you know, it helps you do what you're called to do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So true. So, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, just how it kind of helped you to be a bridge. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of times when people associate, you know, manhood and things like that. A lot of times yeah. it's associated with, you know, you're having that steak and potatoes and, you know, all that machoism that's kind of surrounded around food subliminally that we've kind of been, you know, taught through whatever. Right. Um, talk about, and, and, and the you have your, your show that Real Men Eat Plants, if, if that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how you're shape, reshaping that narrative about men and what it means to be a real man and eating plants is, is, is beneficial for men. Yeah, I think, you know, what's really interesting is I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, one of the things I feel like we've been doing with, with the whole podcast, The Real Men Eat Plants, is where we're going is, you know, we're what is what is it about this podcast that's going to be different than every other dude that does a podcast that's vegan now because you've got the guys like the Robert Cheeks and the Jeff Palmers and we know like the protein debate is just not a debate anymore like we know that it's it's a red herring so it's like do we want to do we don't want to do the protein thing like it's been done to death you know there are no protein deficiency wards in the hospital we know that there's protein body there's vegan bodybuilders so and so we started talking and it's like If a guy is centering his manhood around the size of the steak that's on his plate, he's compensating for something else. And that does not determine your manhood. Um, and so one of the things we, we, we kind of talked about was this is why I think it's not just about food. It's not just about losing weight. This is why I say for me, what I saw internally going on a plant-based diet, how it even enhanced me as a man. And what I mean by that is anyone can join the crowd at a cookout and eat a steak, but it's going to take a real man to walk up and go, I'm just going to have the baked potato and the salad or I, Hey, I brought a block of smoked tofu. Can you throw that on the grill for me? You know? And so, um, but I think, um, my partner and co-host, um, Dr. Rich, Richmond McCarty, when we started kind of driving down like how what is it that we're going to do and what is it we're going to talk about that's going to be different than every other plant-based podcast and i think what we've talked about and come to understand that guys their apprehension is i i don't think the apprehension of is i'm not gonna I, i'm just not gonna eat the plants you know i i think it feeds into other things of what culture says a man is and a real man takes care of his kids a real man is able to be is able to be transparent and vulnerable and and authentic and when you see men that bring those qualities to the table that is a man that's confident internally um and it and it helps you to move towards making those decisions and a plant-based diet is i i feel like can be part of that and so we are, and, and how we're connecting all this is like, basically dudes get in the kitchen and cook for your wives. Like 
go make them a plant-based meal. You know, show your kids that you're trying to take care of them. And that's what we did with our kids is like when we were trying to get them on board, like when we started taking the gummy bears and the candy bars out of the, you know, out of the pantry, you know, one of the things was, hey, daddy's doing this to take care of himself, but if it's beneficial for daddy and helps him, why wouldn't I want to do this for you? You know? And so that for me was just like, a, that's why I said going and moving towards a plant powered lifestyle or a plant based lifestyle, it's not one dimensional. It affects all these parameters and that, that we walk in daily. And I think what we want to do with the podcast is really move into the emotional for men and move into the, the family aspect and how it impacts those that you love most around you and how it can bring more security. And that's what real men do. They step up to the plate and they tackle those issues. And, um, you know, it, it, when you bring that up, uh, Cersei, it, it reminds me of, uh, um, a quote that I read, um, Gosh, I think it was by um, uh, Pat Conroy, the author. And when Dr. Rich and I were talking about doing the podcast and what direction we were going to go in, um, I read this quote to him and I was going to read it to y'all just because I think it goes right with your question um, with what you just asked me. It said, it says, um, American men are allotted just as many tears as American women. But because we are forbidden to shed them, we die long before women do, with our hearts exploding or our blood pressure rising or our lives eaten away by alcohol, because that lake of grief inside of has lake and in, lake of grief inside of us has no outlet. We men die because our faces were not watered enough. And I just thought that is what as men we need to be talking about. Like and how does a plant-based diet go into that? Well, are you bold enough to just say, I'm going to walk away from vices that have harmed me? The, the meat, the butter, the dairy, the cheeses that I've gorged on that have, you know, that are destroying me internally. Am I saying that those around me are important enough to lay down what I want to hold on to? And at the end of the day, hold on to it if you want. But don't say it makes your life better because it doesn't. I mean, from a health perspective, we know scientifically that it doesn't. And I would say that I'm not even advocating that men do what I did. I think it's better to just go cold turkey. I've said that. But I think when we're pushing the movement and we're trying to get people on board, if, if you can just change your thinking instead of eating the big steak with a little baked potato and a little side of broccoli – eat a third of that and then make your whole plate, the broccoli and the potatoes and fill up on that, you know, and, and, and I'll take that as a win all day long. I'll take it as a win all day long. If we can change the portion, you know, and changing the way that we think about food. But I think that is where we're trying to go with men is, you know, why wouldn't you do this? If you thought it could enhance your life and bring more security to family, why wouldn't you do it? And so, that's why I say, again, it doesn't, it's not just, it doesn't have this one dimensional affect. It, it affects, it's peripheral and it, the way that it flows out and everything that it touches. Yeah, that's super powerful, Shane. Um, you know, I, I love how you just brought it home, you know, that are we, are we saying that this is more important than these other things and these other people, quite frankly, um, you don't, you don't think about that consciously, but that, you know, when you look at the actions that are being taken relative to the consequences and who's affected. Um, that's absolutely the case. Um, so, well, and I think too, it's, it's like, do you want to spend your life in your fifties and your sixties on statins and, you know, diabetes medication on insulin? Mm -hmm. And we know those aren't drugs that heal you from those things. They just control your symptoms. And so, for me, and I'll just say it, a real man is a guy that's going to figure out what the problem is and he's going to fix it, mm -hmm. even though it might make him a little uncomfortable. He, men are not doing things because they don't want to be inconvenienced. That, that, that's what it is. And I can say that as a man because that's where I was. That was going to be inconvenient. 
I'm going to have to learn how to cook a new way. I'm going to have to buy certain groceries. I can't through run through McDonald's anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, but I tell people this love and care for your family and your friends. Love is not about being efficient or convenient all the time. It actually, it, it's hard to love sometimes. And sometimes that means letting go of things we want to hold on to. Love is not always efficient. And so we have this idea that it should just be easy all the time. And it's not. And it requires, it's like why Jesus said, come and die. He didn't mean just literally die right there. He meant die to self-determination, die to always wanting to do it your way. And we, we have forgotten that as human beings whether you're a Christian or not, real love exists. Does real love does not exist without sacrifice, and neither does health. <laughs> so, I mean, everybody's got to sacrifice something. Okay, TJ, I thought you had a thought you were gonna. Did she freeze? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I thought you had a thought you were gonna stay. Uh, yeah, you. go. You can go ahead. I keep talking. Okay. No, I, I mean that's powerful. <laughs> she, was, she was pulling a Mitch McConnell on us. <laughs> oh come on! Come oh on, god, Shane. that was terrible. Oh, <laughs> uh, everybody's gonna write in and go, "Oh, he's McConnell shaming now." Oh <laughs> no. Uh, but can, you know that's powerful. That yeah, <laughs> that's powerful because I I think what you've done is that you've you've moved so far beyond the plate, Shane, that as a man watching this, it's it just realizes that getting healthy has so many more um, mm -hmm. facets to it, right? It's really not just about the steak and potatoes. It's about your family, your community, your, you know, your values, all of those things that you are manning up by not eating the meat, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was really, really powerful. Um, yeah, and I and I think a lot of men listening to this, hearing it from a male's perspective, I think is going to be beneficial because I think a lot of times when male are hearing women speak about their journey and how they work, it's like, okay, women could do this, but what about from a male's perspective? So I'm always intrigued when I um hear men speak of it from their perspective because let's face it, you know, we talk a lot about emotional eating, mm -hmm. and I, and women connect with that, but like you said sometimes the food is masking things for men too. And when you pull those foods away and you have to, like you said, deal with your own emotions and deal with your own stressors and all these things straight up and find other ways that also can be impactful too. So. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, and I, I, I don't want men to hear me saying, Oh, we got to put our manliness aside. And that's not what we're supposed to do. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I like to say it like this. It's like we were created very intentionally. And I always say, you know, it's like, I don't know if you remember the Seinfeld episode where, um, um, not to go TMI or too deep, but I, I love Seinfeld and, and Jerry is dating this woman who walks around with no clothes on all the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if y'all remember this. And, and he's like, and then George goes, well, that's a dream. And he goes, not really. You know, it's like when she's buffing the floor or fixing the chain mm -hmm. on a bicycle. And Jerry says, well, the way I'll get her to stop is I'll do the same thing. And it has the complete opposite effect that he thought it did. And he feels shame. And he's telling Elaine about it at the, the diner the next day. And, and Elaine goes, oh, wait a minute. You took your clothes off. She goes, no, 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 no. That is not a good look for a man. And he goes, why not? And Elaine goes, well, a woman's body is a work of art. It has curves. You know, it's, it's delicate. A man is like utilitarian. He's like a tank. You know, it's just for getting around, you know, that kind of thing. My point is, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to go in the gutter here, but my point is it's like, yeah, there's a reason we try to guard our emotions sometimes. And there, there are reasons that we try to, to be strong in front of our wives. One, we want to impress our wives. We want to mm -hmm. Im impress, you know, that's kind of how we made. We, we, we want our wives to look at us and go, ah, oh, that's my man, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But we also kind of have this nature of, you know, they say, you know, to go out, grab something, kill it and bring it home. There's this idea of I'm the one that's got to support my family. I've got the one that's got to do this. And so we are we can be guarded. Mm -hmm. So but it doesn't mean that we 
we get rid of those things. It's, it's like Jordan Peterson said. He said, a good man is not a man that's not dangerous. A good man is a dangerous man that has that dangerousness under control. Mm. And at first, when I first heard that, I went, oh, I don't, and then I started, I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. It means that at the right time, he's willing to become the dangerous man to take care of the ones closest to him to prevent mm the evil from getting to the ones he loves the most mm -hmm. but that danger that danger that's left unchecked destroys everything oh, yeah. and, and that danger can come in as not being willing to be open and vulnerable and transparent mm -hmm. because then what does it do it's like pat conroy said it shuts us down we harden you know we struggle a lot of men are given over to alcoholism because i'm not good enough i'm not living up to my potential mm -hmm. i'm not achieved enough in life and Instead of realizing, hey, where you are, man, embrace your lot. Mm -hmm. Like recognize the moment that you're in. It's like, do y'all watch The Office? Have y'all ever seen The Office? You know, oh, yeah. I love, that's my favorite show. Rain Wilson that plays Dwight Schrute is just, I think it's one of the best characters in sitcom. Andre and I were actually talking about this last night when I got home from Nebraska. And she said, because I had, was thinking about this while I was in Nebraska, she said that they were interviewing him and she said while he was doing the office he didn't get a he didn't get hardly any roles in movies or anything because he was typecast as Dwight Schrute and that's how everyone saw him mm -hmm. and he said he spent almost his in, most of his time on the office being pissed off at the world because he wasn't getting cast in movies and seeing his star go up so to speak and then he said after he got out of the office and just had time to reflect, he goes, I cannot believe I was that ungrateful. Mm -hmm. He said, I was part of something huge and wonderful that made the world laugh, but all I did was complain in the moment. And I think that is so telling. And I feel like as I've gotten older, what I've tried to do is instead of do that, like try to recognize, it's like Andy Bernard said, if there was a way to know that you're in the good old days before you left them, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I think that that as men, you know, I mean, those are the things that we can endanger ourselves to is not recognizing the good moments and not doing the things to take care of our families and stepping up and and in a sense, warding off the the uh, food evil that's coming through the doors, you know, and being willing to stand up and not be afraid to go, well, I'm a conservative, but people think I'm a liberal if I do this at some point. It's just about. Are you going to do, are we going to do what's right and be willing to take the arrows of false, you know, false mm -hmm. narratives and stereotypes? And I am now, you know, and so, and a real friend is going to stick by you. Your family is going to stick by you. So at the end of the day, I mean, is there really anything else, you know? Yeah. All right. So um, just from a day to day perspective, Shane, as people are listening to this, what can you like describe what you eat in a typical day? <laughs> Everybody uh, wants to know this stuff. So <laughs> I, I know, but it's funny. I get this question all the time and it's like I have to think, go, I don't even remember what I ate two days ago. So is, um, you know, I'm one of these. I don't meal prep. I don't, everybody goes, ah, oh, your pictures, you must really keep the fridge stacked and packed. And I go, man, I'm going to the grocery store four times a week. Um, you know, typically through the week, I still do what I pretty much have always done. I, through the week, I'm, I'm pretty boring from a, a food perspective, just because, you know, with the blog being my job. Um, so, I mean, so what I mean is, as I, I like through the week when kids are in school and Andre is working in the house and I'm in the house, I want things to be efficient. I want to be healthy, but I want them to be efficient and very low in effort, you know? So typically breakfast um, is very simple. It's like a bowl of oats with berries. And, you know, if I have chia seeds or flaxseed, I'll throw that in there. Uh, maybe some walnuts. Um, always one to two bananas chopped up with the berries. I love bananas. Um, and, and I'll just kind of hose it down with like almond milk or oat milk. And so I eat it like, I don't, I don't like cooking oats anymore. I love raw oats. I love to eat oats raw. So I'll typically do a bowl like that. Um, and so that's usually for breakfast, unless it's a run, if I'm running in the morning or working out in the morning, 
I typically will skip breakfast because I don't like to work out with something on my stomach. So there are times what I'll do is I will occasionally do like a protein smoothie or something just to have some energy going into the workout. But um, I will say I drink coffee. I drink it black. I'm not giving up my coffee. I think there's enough studies to show that it has some medicinal purposes. And now I'm not like a coffee holic where I drink it eight, nine times a day. I have a cup in the morning. And then 2.30, 3 o'clock, my wife and I shut down work for about 45 minutes, make us a small cup a piece, watch an episode we've been binging, and then we go back to work. But it's our way of shutting down the afternoon. And um, So that's the morning. Lunch, I mean, sometimes I'll go in and make a quick salad, throw it in a bowl. Uh, we always keep rice in the fridge. And, you know, we typically, uh, we always we have tons of no salt added chickpeas and black beans so lunch is always very simple it's usually we just call them chipotle bowls so it's usually just some rice with black beans and um lettuce and cilantro salsa um uh refried beans if we have them we'll throw those in there you know we always keep one or two cans of corn open in the fridge because we'll eat them through a couple of days so we can sprinkle that on there and so that's, that's really it. I mean, um, that, so it's pretty much that it's that simple, um, dinner, um, when the girls are playing soccer and we're kind of all rushing out, I mean, a lot of times, to be honest with you, it might be something like hummus and veggie sandwiches. Like everybody just kind of grab and go do your thing. Um, Wednesday nights typically is when everybody's home, uh, because you know, here in the deep South, a lot of the churches treat Wednesday night like the Sabbath. So nobody goes to church on, you know, nobody does anything on a Wednesday night. And um, so we'll typically that that's a lot of times I'll cook like a real dinner and we'll sit down because they don't have anything on Wednesday night. And then if we do that, I'm usually making like a um, lentil shepherd's pie or um, we'll do um, I'm trying to think uh the buffalo chickpea casserole that's on my website, that we've been doing that a lot lately. That's just really, really good. And for I'm so thankful all my kids love spicy food. So um, so we'll do that. Um, so pretty simple through the week. Uh the weekends we get a little more adventurous. That's when I say, you know, we cook the special recipes. So Saturday mornings are usually always uh pancake day. So uh, usually doing like, um, and I'll vary it up. I'll do chocolate chip, peanut butter pancakes. So I'll do banana pancakes, blueberry pancakes. Um, I try if I get enough head, head, um, if I can get a head on the week, I will, you know, slice up some tofu to marinate. So we have tofu bacon or make my sausage patties, you know, um, Sometimes it's as simple as making our tofu scramble and I'll make some of my cashew cream cheese and we'll do bagels and um, tofu scramble, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a little more, um, I don't want to say adventurous. It's a little more involved, the, the meals. Uh, lunch on the weekends, on Saturdays especially, we're all kind of going and doing things. Andre and I are working around the house or something. So it's kind of a grab and go or we may make a thing of hummus and just everybody kind of nibble you know, that kind of thing. But dinner is usually like, you know, I may make a seitan roast and potatoes and, you know, that kind of thing. Or we'll do like a meatloaf, mashed potatoes, mac and cheese, you know, really try to, I'll spend a couple of hours in the kitchen cooking because I still, I, I mean, it's my happy place. So, um, and then Sundays, we, you know, we're trying to get out the door to go to church. And so breakfast is usually non-existent because we're always running late. So, um, but then we'll come home and, you know, we, one of our favorite Sunday things to do is we get, um, hoagie rolls and we just do like a veggie sandwich bar and we do veggie subs. And I mean, I'll do like some, my vegan Mississippi comeback sauce or, you know, the mayo I make or something like that. And we'll almost do like Italian chop subs with just veggies and you know with the olives and just pile it in and toast them and i mean we love doing that so subs are a big thing so we'll you know we'll do that and then sometimes sunday night i may make 
like the seitan ribs and we'll do like a or the jackfruit barbecue like i i mean and I'll, I'll make potato salad and it's you know the typical southern fare of baked beans potato salad and barbecue you know and so uh but weekends is where I, we tend to get a little more involved with the cooking but through the week it's just it's usually really really simple and and that's what i like to tell people too like if you're trying to get into this way of eating, the biggest mistake people make is trying to get too complicated too quickly. And, you know, they're like, go buy rice, go buy beans, go buy some whole grains and start there and like eat the same thing for breakfast every day, Monday through Friday, save the weekends for checking out recipes and cooking and experimenting. Don't do that through the week because you don't have time, you know, and um so i like to say variety is not always the spice of life <laughs> that's good that was extensive shane that's why it's shane and simple wow that's amazing it just you know you kind of just made it sh just show how easy it is to to eat this way but not only that and to, to have those pockets of times where you can you know deep dive into deeper recipes and things like that. But you mentioned something about the hoagie rolls. What's going on with this cookbook? You're making, do you oh. make a bread? Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> PTSD. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, I, here, I'm going to put this on because I, are, are y'all are, are y'all muting like in between conversation? Uh, so a little bit, but I we can turn it on. It's okay. No, no, no it's fine. It's because it's like I'll see you go. I'll see you laugh, and I don't hear anything. Oh, <laughs> it, oh hold You're on. Like, are they laughing or are they faking? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on a second. So I'm gonna go. Oh, PTSD. Ah. No, wait a minute. <laughs> there we go. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you and All your. Right. Is that like is that like a separate system or is that on your computer or what? No, it is. Uh, so it's my Rode Podcaster. It's the um for you know it's specifically for doing podcasts and it has these little sound banks. It's like, Gigi, how do you feel today? Oh, Shane, I'm sad. You know you oh. do that, or you go, don't eat meat, it'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, or. Shane, that wasn't very funny. Crickets. Okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I apologize. So um, no. no, anyway. So yeah, the book. That has been, um, which I, I don't know why I have to tell you all this. Y'all probably wrote your book in like, what, three days just because y'all are no. like pros. And, <laughs> no. And, well, the recipe making book is a total, like a cookbook is, is a yeah. total different thing because you're doing it, the photography. It took, so, yeah. yeah, it took us almost a year, right, Cersei? Yeah. To do yeah, it was almost a year, but we had been thinking about it for a while too. But what's the, what's the name of your book, Shane? What's the title? So it's going to be called uh, Baking Vegan Bread at Home. Mm. So I, I always feel like I have to give a little bit of perspective on this book because, um, you know, when you write a book, you, you get your agent or you come up with the idea and then you shop it to a publisher and then, you know, and you write the book that you want to write, you know, you come up with the idea and that's what you do. Um, I've been wanting to write a book forever. I mean, it's just, I'm one of those that just, you know, I'm the visionary. I know what I want to write about and I know what I want it to look like, but okay, Shane, start. I have no clue where to begin. You know, it's that kind of thing. And so, um, so back in February, I got an email and it's, I think it's pretty common from most bloggers that I talk to that once you start, you know, you know, you get enough followers and you're, you know, you're kind of out there, you're getting all kinds of offers like, Hey, we'll do a book for blah, 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 blah. Or we want to put this art, you know, this kind of thing. And you kind of have to filter through the crap, you know, like what's real, what's not mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so anyway, back at the end of February of this year, I got an email and says, Hey, Shane, my name's Dan. I'm, I'm one of the editors, blah, 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 with Harvard common press division of court, you know, all this. And, um, and he said, um, we'd like to talk to you about writing a book. And I thought, oh, yeah, 
this is awesome. But then I was like, yeah, this is another one of those. And, you know, and, um, so anyway, I didn't respond initially. And when he didn't hear from me for a couple of days, he reached back out and he goes, are you at all interested? He goes, this is legit. We have a budget, blah, 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 blah. You know? And, um, so I reached out and I said, yes, I'd be interested in talking. So I looked at his name, looked at the whole, started doing my own research and I went, oh, this is like legit. This is a legit publisher. So anyway, we, we, we took a meeting as they say, and, um, we just talked and, but what was unusual about this book is they do a lot of culinary and DIY books. And I started looking up and a lot of the books they do, I've seen in Barnes and Noble. And I was like, Oh wow. I didn't realize they did this. And they sent me books they had done that had been some bestsellers. I went, Oh wow. Okay. This is legit. You know? So, um, he even started off, he goes, now this is not normal. Um, but what had happened was, um, I guess since coming out of COVID, you know, everybody was staying home and cooking became a hobby because people couldn't travel. And one of the things that was, uh, one of the most, I guess one of the most popular hobbies was people were learning to bake bread. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's still popular. And people are doing it, but they'd seen a surge in vegan bread and, um, and most bread, if you go to the grocery store, you see is accidentally vegan, you know, like mm -hmm. sourdoughs and things mm -hmm. like that. But they were wanting to get into a, like an artisan deep dive, like of mm -hmm. European bread. So, you know, like, um, you know, brioche breads and challah breads, things that normally have egg and dairy and lots of butter and things like that. Mm. So, um, but he said, but, but the unusual thing about this book was, is they were not looking for, they were not intentionally looking for me to do a Shane and Simple book. As a matter of fact, the day that I had my first audible meeting or video meeting, I said, can I just ask you a question? Why did I'm thinking here, my ego's getting stroked. Hey, they came to Shane Martin from Shane and Simple wanting a cookbook done. And I was like, how did you find out about me? And I'm just waiting to hear, oh, I saw it on this site or this site. And he goes, we just went to Pinterest and typed in this type of bread and you popped up. And we thought, well, maybe this guy's. And I was like, my, my ego went, it was kind of like, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, but he said, we've developed this idea for the book. This is what we want it to be about. It's funded. It's ready to go. We just need the author. And so for according, so looking at your Pinterest page, you're a bread guy, right? And I'm like, you don't ever tell anybody, no, I can't do that. I just went, yeah, I eat a lot of bread. That was my response. <laughs> yeah, I eat tons of bread. Um, so I, I started talking to him. He was giving more ideas about the book and basically what they were needing is just an author it mm -hmm. was that i was doing this on behalf of shane and simple they needed you know somebody to step in that could develop the recipes so we talked for a couple of days i thought through it um and actually did not tell them no right away i told them i've got to think on this for a week and or so and they were totally gracious um said yeah you know we we're kind of running behind but we can kind of like to wait, but this is one of those things where if you say no, somebody else is going to do it because it's yeah. a chance to write a book, you know, yeah. and, you know, there's an advantage, like it's a legit thing. And so, so I started reaching out to other blogger friends. I think I even talked to you, Gigi, about it um, one point because part of me realized if I do this book, they were wanting a minimum of like 65 to 72 recipes. And you know, included in that could be things like biscuits and pancakes and stuff like that. But what I realized is if I do this, it's going to be mainly a vegan cookbook, not nice, not like a whole foods plant-based cookbook. Mm -hmm. and that's not what they were asking for. So the thing that I was wrestling with, is if I put my name on it and I come out and I'm telling everybody to eat a whole food plant-based diet, and then they see these recipes with some oils and the vegan butters, how am I going to handle that? And so I reached out to one follower of mine who was a New York Times bestseller and talked to him about it. And he said, look, man, he said, you need to look at this as college tuition and you're getting a chance 
to get an education and writing a book. And it's an incredible opportunity. And he said, and I never will forget. He said, you know, when you went to school, you didn't agree with everything they taught you, but you were still paying the tuition mm -hmm. and you wrote your papers and you did those things, you know? And so um, he said, you're going to be doing more good than harm if you do the book, you know, because you're providing something that's removing the animal products and you're doing mm -hmm. stuff like that. And he said, you don't have to promote it as a Shane and simple book, you know? And he said, if you do well, then you're in a position to go back and say, now I want to do the cookbook I want to do. And I want to put this, the Shane and simple brand on it and really put mm -hmm. it out. there." So my wife and I talked about it and I called him back and I said, okay, I'll do the book. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were gracious. They were like, look, if you have recipes on your blog, you want to include that fit this, do it. So there are some, so it's a, so all that to say, it's a completely bread book. Um, it's about baking it at home in the oven. And I did not realize there were that many types of breads when I started doing research for this. I yeah. mean, I thought this is going to be easy. I'm going to cruise. I can do, I'll, I'll do 10 pancake recipes, <laughs> you know, and they go, you can't do that. We got legitimate, you know, it's like saying, go, go to the blackboard and say, I will not talk or write a 500 essay and you cannot go. The little Creek went drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, one pancake recipe, one biscuit recipe, you know, but we need breads. So there is everything from vegan challah bread uh, Swiss, Swiss braided. I had to learn how to braid bread. I had never done that before. Um, the, the favorite one was the Japanese milk bread that we had to veganize. And I, I ate so much of that. I literally got sick. It was just, it was unbelievable. Like, you know, cause I had to test it to make sure it was going to be good. Right. So, um, so anyway, um, started on and everything started out good. Um, got the manu the first few ideas of the manuscript handed in and they were really good at guiding me through and everything, but because time management and administration is not my gift, um, the book was supposed to be done January, June 21st is when I was supposed to have the manuscript in. And then like two weeks in after, well, after we got the author contracts done, the creative director had gone to the blog and said, Hey, they were going to hire a food photographer from Southern Living Magazine in Birmingham because that was the closest one in the region. So basically what I would do is develop recipes, send them the recipe, they make it and shoot it. Oh. They go to the website and they see, oh, you take your own photographs. Would you, why don't we just hire you to be your own photographer? So I got hired by the creative department to do my own photography. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Well, I develop all the recipes, everything's good. And instead of making a recipe and shooting it, I don't think that way. I make all the recipes and then I got to go back and make them all again and shoot. And so I think I ended up just turning the last photograph in three weeks ago or something like that. So okay. it about killed me. I mean, I was staying up all night, pulling all night or shooting, but all that to say it's a bread book and it's, I, I feel like it turned out great. I, I had the girls in the kitchen helping me. We were under time crunch. They were making the recipes. My wife took a day off from her graphic design and stayed in the kitchen for 10, 12 hours one day baking. Like, wow. and it was, and so it became a lot of fun. It was almost like a family affair. And so mm -hmm. kind of goes back to those when in the stressful moments, you know, taking stock of the, you know, the happy moments. And so that was really cool. But there is, like I said, you know, your typical artisan breads, sourdough, no need breads. There is a, um, a sour cream and chive bread. That was really good. Um, uh, you know, there's pancakes, banana bread, zucchini breads. Mm -hmm. Um, probably my favorite one though, that I developed was an island pineapple coconut bread. Mm. Oh, wow. That sounds good. You, yeah, y'all, the smell of the house, I can still smell it. It was that good. Like, yeah. that was the one where, you know, and being a food blogger, when I'm making things and the people, the family smells things, are like, can we eat that now? I'm like, no, you can't touch it. It's got to, you know, I'm not done. And that was one of those breads I had made. And, of course, I can't really move it until it completely cools down because I need to be able to, you know, move it and, 
and and stage it and everything and you want to let it cool down because you don't want it falling apart and it's so moist and all this so they're just smelling the house and this bread and and so finally after i remember the day i got it got it shot and um the girls came in and saw it sitting on the counter they like can we have it now it's like yeah it was gone in a matter of literally like 20 minutes they come in from <laughs> soccer practice all three of the girls at home just demolished it you know but but there's, I mean, it's, there's non, there's non bread. There's, mm. um, there is, uh, uh, English muffins. I mean, you have, any, and, you have croissants. I, you know, what's the one thing I didn't do. I, I tried doing the croissants and even using some of the, the vegan butters and the stuff. I just did not have the hand for it. I just, I tried and I didn't like the way it turned out. And so, um, I, I had this, I had this idea I was going to do chocolate croissants, you know, chocolate filled croissants, but yeah. I just could not get it. You know, croissants are kind of like biscuits, you know, you got to cut in and you got to do this. And I, I just couldn't make it work. And I was like, yeah, on a scale of one to 10, I would have said they were about a four and a half or a five. And yeah. I just, I couldn't put mediocrity in there, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so but, um. But there's a lot of breads. But all that to say, I need to preface it with, I would appreciate everyone buying it when it comes out and giving it to people as a gift or, and, and even keeping it. But I do want to let everybody know, this is not a whole foods, plant-based bread book. So yeah. there are some oils. There's some vegan butters. There's some vegan cheeses in it. Uh, some of the cheeses I've made with nuts and things like that, Some there's some store-bought. But... I kind of took the Dr. McDougal, you know, he said, have some birthday cake on your birthday. Just don't make every day your birthday, you know? Right, it's right, right. So I would say if you're, especially for people trying to find an entry into eating a plant-based diet, mm -hmm. you know, this is a great way if you want to make something special for like, if you have, you know, people who are Jewish that love challah bread, mm -hmm. you know? it usually has eggs. It's a very eggy bread. So mm -hmm. if they're looking for something for their families and they're trying to eliminate dairy from their diets, you know, I, I feel like, and somebody told me this, they say, even if it's not a whole food vegan, people that have dairy allergies are going to benefit from something like this. Mm -hmm. You know, So again, it's that idea of, are we going to preach to the choir? Are we going to try to reach the masses kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? And so yeah. that's kind of how I looked at it, but it was, it, I will tell you, it was one of the hardest things I have ever done as far as my, occupationally of since being a blogger. And a lot of that was because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So <laughs> but I'm sure you learned a ton. I'm sure you yeah. learned a ton of process. Mm -hmm. I learned a ton of what not to do and how to do it. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, the second one's coming up. So you'll be able to be um, ready for that. <laughs> I, accept, I mean, it was like the minute I sent the last photo. I sent the last photo in and I, the next day I woke up and I got emails from the editor and the creative director and they go, Shane, these are great. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then the meeting he goes, okay, let's talk about the next book. And I'm sitting here going, oh Lord, I, I can't even think about this right now. So, <laughs> you need a know, break. You need a little break in between. Yeah. Well, you know, it was funny. I, it was, I, I remember sending that last photo at like one thirty in the morning. Like I was done and, uh, and I don't recommend this. I mean, a few weeks leading up to this, I was working two and three nights in a row till four, four thirty in the morning, sleeping a couple hours, getting up and, you know, and I, I ended up getting like physically sick because I wasn't sleeping enough. Mm -hmm. And it took me a, a while to recover. And when I shot that last photo and I finished editing at like 1, 1.30 in the morning and I uploaded it and I let them know, hey, it's there. So the next day, thir it was I, I should say Thursday, that was like Wednesday morning, you know, Thursday morning, late Wednesday night. And I don't hear anything on Thursday. And I'm thinking, oh, no, they hated it. It's not good. Then Friday morning is when they responded. They said, hey, Shane, looks great. Thank you so much, blah, 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 blah. Then that afternoon, Dan, the editor, he called me. He said, okay, the money on the table is for the next one. And it's a bread book, but it's using a bread machine. Yeah. And and I'm like, I, do I want to be the bread guy? You know? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> and so uh, I said, well, let's talk about it, you know? And and so 
I, um, but when they said, yeah, it's great. And I saw that, um, I got tickets to the Mississippi state football game. And one of my daughters had never been. And, and I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a, I told my wife, I said, if it's okay with you, I'm going to take her to the football game. And one of my, my oldest daughter just graduated. She still lives down there. She works for the parks and rec. And then my son has a house with a couple of guys. So I took one of my daughters, she stayed with my oldest daughter and I stayed with my son. And I told my wife, I came back Sunday night and I was like, I said, I honestly feel like I had a vacation because I'd had this hanging over me since yeah. April and May, you know, yeah. just try, the urgency and the burden to get it done. And yeah. I was like, Oh, I was done. And so, and then it hit me and talk about being a man and shedding your tears. Monday morning, my wife and I were having our coffee and I just kind of started tearing up and she goes, you okay? And I said, babe, I wrote a book mm -hmm. and it and I was like, and I think I just started crying because I was so exhausted, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that relief of, you know, it's done, it's in the can and, and it's, I'm going to be able to walk in Barnes and Noble and see this thing. And mm -hmm. yes, I would love for it to sell, but. I, I don't know. There's a part of me that you can just go, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, you know, it's just so, um, but that quickly dissipated when that email came up. Okay. Let's talk about the next one. I was like, oh man, <laughs> let me enjoy the moment, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. What, what an amazing journey you've been on, you know, just by making that one decision to change your health to the blog, to creating the book, to the changes in your family, to, it's been an amazing journey. It's been so interesting hearing all about it. Um, tell us, Shane, where where can tell us about the book, the name of the book, but also where can people find you on your blog and get all your wonderful whole food plant based recipes and all that other stuff? Sure. So again, the name of the book is going to be called Baking Vegan Bread at Home. It's mm -hmm. a very good book for like a DIYer. It's going to be a great gift, Mother's Day. It'll be out March of 2024. So, and you'll be able to buy it at Amazon and I think really any bookstores that you're close to, but, um, but it'll be called baking vegan bread at home. Um, now, as far as, uh, I tell people, you know, the best place to go for the web, for the, for the recipes are Shane and mm -hmm. Um, it it's free. There's no charge. The recipes are free. Um, you can subscribe and what that does, there is no charge for that. You just get the newsletter and the updates when recipes come out. And sometimes I'll actually send recipes to subscribers that aren't on the blog that, you know, I may be just working on and say, Hey, y'all take this and tell me what you think. I'd love to hear from you. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the best way to get everything. But I also tell people when you're pursuing this lifestyle, community is important. You need people around you. And a lot of times you're not going to have a lot of support, even with those that you are in contact with on a daily basis, because there are some people who's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm cool doing what I do right now. So there's the Shane and Simple page at Facebook. It's Shane and Simple Cooking. Um, that's where I just post everything. We'll throw things out there. And um, that's just me kind of guiding everything. And, you know, I control what goes on there. But there is there are two other options. There's a Shane and Simple group on Facebook, and that is really about the community aspect of it. And what I love about that page is people ask questions. I, I moderate it very little except if I get a warning, like or people are advertising for products they're trying to sell or, you know, something just people are just being turds, you know, like wanting to start fights all the time. Can we say turds on here? I'm sorry. Sure. I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm not the most <laughs> person. When people want to be poopy heads and, you know, and, and so, um, but it really to see the way people connect with one another and people say, Hey, I'm really struggling with this. And just to see people come along, it really, somebody told me the other day, they said, Shane, we, we see bloggers and their Facebook pages really are just, they're putting things out there. They're sharing the recipes. But they said, when I see the way people respond to you or to one another, it really feels like a community. And I was like, that is really what we're trying to create. So the group is a great place to go just to get support, to ask questions. I do jump in and respond and provide links and things like that. But, you know, it's, it's so good because there's a lot of times people ask questions 
and they're not even asking me. They're asking one another. And so I'll just make sure everything's kind of staying on the rails. But it's just so so it's really has turned into a community. And I think there's probably like 10,000 members over on that one. Um, mm -hmm. But it just really it's really encouraging to see that. So that's what that's a great place to go. And then there is actually a Facebook subscriber, Shane and Simple, where you actually pay. I think it's like four ninety nine a month. Um, it's still kind of in the jumping off point, but it's going to be a place where I'm going to be pro posting a video every other day, cooking demos. That's kind of, and you, you, you will need to get at, pay to get access to that. But that being said, um, the Shane and simple fan page on Facebook and the group are really two great places to go to get info. But again, the website, Shane and is where everything resides. Awesome. So <laughs> and there's a Pinterest page too. So, awesome. Great. Well, Shane, thank you so much. It's always so much fun talking to you. We've had you on Cook and Chat a few times, and it's always uh, just a treat for us to interact with you. And so, we're just so grateful for your time. Well, I am so honored that y'all asked me to be on here. And, Cersei, I, we have got to figure out something. Mm -hmm. To where the three of us at some point are in the same room together. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> I, that has to happen over the course of the next year or something. Yeah, Just, it will. It will happen. Yeah. It, it has to happen. But yeah, thank y'all because Gigi, you know I love you and just again we talk about it every time, but it's just it's been one of those friendships that just connected and mm -hmm. it just is a pickup where we left off. And Cersei, it's crazy just getting to know you through Gigi. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to um, one of the speakers at the um, at the Healthy for a Lifetime conference in Omaha. I was at, and she was one of the. She's a she's an athlete. Ella just she does uh, crazy sexy vegan over at Instagram. Just you oh, know, Ella. Um, yeah, we know Ella. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So got to meet her, and we were having dinner Friday night, and. Um, she had been doing a podcast for like 10 years with her co-host and had never met her face to face. And that yeah. they were friends just kind of over zoom and do, and, and she said, I'm so excited, but she goes, she goes, but it's like, we're like close friends. And, you yeah. know, and, and I said, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> and, and, and so I kind of feel like that way with you, Cersei, like with the mm -hmm. cooking chat and getting yeah. to know you through Gigi, it's almost, I feel like when we do sit down at the same table, I, I don't know that, I mean, there's always something great about the physical connection. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But there, the there's already a connection before the connection. The emotional and the yeah. intellectual connection. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, that has to happen at some point. But yeah, yeah. again, all that to say, thank y'all so much. I, I love seeing what is uh, going on with y'all, like the way things are growing and it just seems like things are taking off. And then, I mean, y'all are on the, I thought it was so cool. Both of us got to be a part yeah. of Plants. Yeah, year. we were that in the same awesome. room, but online. So hopefully that will happen in person sometime. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you were on Rip's podcast. I heard yeah. that. That was yeah. awesome. I, yeah. I told Andre, I said, it's just great to see the people that I give advice to succeed like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shane. Funny. I keyed. I keyed. So. You need to press that button. Press that button. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, me. No, thank y'all, though. This has been a pleasure. It's always good. Love what you're doing and love y'all. I mean, just oh, love The feeling is mutual. We love you too, Shane. And everything you're doing, we're yeah. just all, all over it. So thank you again. And uh, until next time. Oh.